All right, we left off last time talking about the production of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. And the key thing to notice here is the importance of electrolyte balance, right? <clears throat> because we need hydrogen ion in the lumen of the stomach and chloride ion in the lumen of the stomach to meet each other to make this hydrochloric acid, which is going to help us break down proteins with the help of pepsinogen. Remember we talked about the cells of the stomach make and secrete pepsinogen, which when it's pepsinogen is acted on by HCL in the stomach, it forms pepsin, and pepsin is an enzyme that breaks the peptide bonds of large proteins and breaks them down into amino acids. Hydrochloric acid also, we said, helps to kill bacteria in the stomach and keep, because the food we eat is definitely not sterile. So it has that function as well. And in order to make hydrochloric acid, we have to have carbon dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide is always a product of metabolism. So I think it just shows how intricate our body systems are and how these electrolytes are recycled and reused for different things in the body. So carbon dioxide is a waste gas as a result of metabolism and breaking down glucose. Remember, it's a waste product of the Krebs cycle. And then we bring that carbon dioxide in, it diffuses from higher concentration to lower concentration, diffuses into the parietal cell, right, where it's converted to bicarbonate ion and hydrogen ion with the help of this carbonic anhydrase forming carbonic acid. So it just ionizes, and then the hydrogen ion goes that way. So where does the hydrogen ion for HCl come from ultimately? CO2, carbon dioxide, okay? And then the chloride ion comes in from our diet, right? When we eat salty things, the Na plus and the Cl minus separate from each other. We know that Na plus is really important for muscle contraction, nerve conduction, right? The depolarization of the action potential relies on sodium. So it's just really cool how these ions are, they separate from the compounds that we bring them in via, like salt, table salt, and they go their separate ways and have different functions in the body. Okay, so when we talk about the stomach, remember the prefix gastra means stomach. So I remember taking a test one time, and it was early in the nursing program, and I did not uh, study the, the different tubes. There was a nasogastric tube and a nasoenteric tube. Where does the tip of the tube end? Well, I knew gastro means stomach, so a nasogastric tube means the, the tube is going in the nose and ending in the stomach, nasogastric. Nasoenteric tube, I know entero means intestines, small intestines, so I knew that tube went in the nose and ended in the small intestine, and that does, we do have those two different types of tubes. So if you know those prefixes, it gives you a little hint. Or if you're on a test and it says, what cell, which of the following cells secretes gastrin, I know it's the stomach because gastra means stomach, okay? Gastric bypass, we're bypassing the stomach. So peristalsis we know happens already in the esophagus. Well, peristalsis continues throughout the digestive tract into the stomach. And we have these waves starting at the top of the stomach, the fundus, and moving its way down to the pylorus. So if we go back and look at the stomach, um, we'll just use this small here. Um, so the fundus is here, so the waves go this way from the fundus toward the pylorus because the goal is, is to move that chyme into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. So we have these wave-like contractions moving toward the um, pylorus, and this is single-unit smooth muscle. And single unit smooth muscle we talked about in the last unit on the muscular system has pacemaker cells. So they can generate an action potential, action potential all by themselves. So they're always creating a contractile wave, so we're always digesting. <clears throat> and that's why we should always hear bowel sounds. If someone has an active digestive tract and they're healthy, when you put a stethoscope over the four quadrants of the abdomen, we should hear bowel sounds. And bowel sounds are just like the loud sounds you hear sometimes when you've eaten something that maybe this isn't agreeing with you. You hear that little right? 
is in the stomach, we just hear the little clicking and gurgling sounds when we hear bowel sounds. And that's, that's a good thing. And when someone has had surgery and they've been under anesthesia, sometimes the bowels don't wake up right after surgery. And that's an important thing we try to listen for before we give them you know, a regular diet off the menu. We talked a little bit about that on Monday. But um, these pacemaker cells set the tone for these rhythmic contractions that are always occurring, three per minute, and that's the help of pacemaker cells that do not rely on the autonomic nervous system. But the autonomic nervous system can enhance this process. So it's not that it's totally independent. It enhances the process, but it's not dependent upon the autonomic nervous system. And then if we eat something and we stretch the stomach, that causes the stomach to contract more forcefully. And we learn that in smooth muscle. And as we, when we take it beyond its resting length, it contracts more forcefully. So that is a, a feature of the stomach that helps it to speed up contraction and move things along. And gastrin is that hormone, too, that's released when the stomach is stretched to increase the force of contraction. So again, hormones are present to influence, but they're not boss. The pacemaker cells are boss for getting things started. The nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system through the vagus nerve and the hormones of one, which is gastrin, help and enhance digestion. So we see the contraction more vigorous near the pylorus as we're getting things into the duodenum. And it's only delivered in really small three milliliter spurts. That's half a teaspoon about. So a half a teaspoon of what's in the stomach enters the small intestine. So it's a very slow delivery, which is good. So that gives the small intestine time to act on this food and move it along. And it's also... Uh, Again, we can slow this process down by having protein and fat in the stomach. Again, with alcohol in the stomach, when we have food in there, it goes a little more slowly. It has to work on that food a little more before it delivers to the duodenum. So what regulates gastric emptying is the stretch, the enterogastric reflex is as it's this, the small intestine and the stomach speaking to one another, and it depends on the chyme that enters through the duodenum, what the quality of that chyme is, on how fast things move from the stomach to the small intestine. So like we said, carbohydrate-rich chyme moves quickly through the duodenum. It's easily digested and passes through, and that energy is absorbed quickly. So if you have patients that have a poor appetite, that need some energy, and have digestive issues, we want to give them some things that are high in carbohydrate that'll pass through and be easy to digest, like crackers and toast, right? If people have nausea, we want to give them things that are easily digested. Fatty chyme, it's going to remain in the duodenum for six hours or more, which is okay because, again, if you want a slow digestion, you're going to eat something with a little more fat to it. So these are just arrows that stimulate versus inhibit. So the contractile force of the stomach is going to decline if we have these specific activities. We know that sympathetic activity, which is stress, that's going to decrease contractile force and rate of emptying. And that's why people, when they eat, when they're stressed, they feel like, oh, my, you know, my dinner is just sitting there, right? That's because of the sympathetic domination and the suppression of those parasympathetic neurons. So let's move on then into the small intestine. So it's the major organ of digestion and absorption. So when we talk about the, the job of the digestive system is to digest and absorb nutrients, small intestine is boss. So the, the, the stomach kind of breaks it up mechanically, gets it into that nice liquid, digests a little bit of protein, absorbs a little bit of alcohol, but a majority of all this happens in the small intestine. So our, our, our chyme is not ready to be absorbed yet. It still has large molecules that need more action of digestive enzymes, and that's the job of the small intestine. So it's two to four milliliters long, depending on the individual. And we have the beginning where the small intestine hooks up to the stomach. That's the pyloric sphincter. And where it hooks up to the large intestine, that's the ileocecal valve. And you'll remember those things maybe from general AMP. So the duodenum is the short segment. The jejunum is, is the longer segment. The middle segment and the ileum is at the end. 
So by the time food moves to the ileum, the bacteria that are the healthy bacteria that are normally in our gut, those start to increase by the time we get to the ileum. We start to see that healthy bacteria and the stool is liquefied, or I'm sorry, not the stool, the food is liquefied and most of the nutrients have been taken out. So we're talking about the duodenum here and then all of this is the jejunum and then at the end here is the ileum and the ileum and the first part of the colon is called the cecum, so we have the ileocecal valve controlling movement into the large intestine. So when you get to the small intestine, remember we see this villi, and what is the function of the villi and the microvilli? What do they do? They absorb, but the, what is the, the structural advantage of having a surface like this? Yeah, increased surface area. That's really important if we're going to maximize absorption. We want to make sure that there's lots of surface area for those molecules to come in contact with. And the individual cells the plasma membrane comes up in these little tiny finger-like extensions called microvilli. And the microvilli have a special name called the brush border because as molecules pass by, they interact with the microvilli and the microvilli release digestive enzymes as it passes by. So a brush has bristles on it, so that's like the villi and the microvilli. And then there's circular folds of the small intestine. Kind of looks like the dryer vent that you have coming out the back of your dryer. You know how it has those metal rings and then has the squishy part? That's what it looks like in the small intestine. And that kind of allows the food, again, to kind of spiral through the small intestine and really come in contact with the walls for good digestion and absorption. So here we can see those spiral walls. So that's the just gives a little turbulence to that food so it comes in contact. And here's the blood vessels that are going to carry the digestive nutrients from the absorbed nutrients from the cells and take it off to the liver, right, to the hepatic portal vein for filtering before it hits the vena cava and goes to the rest of the body. So everything we eat has to pass through the liver first um, before it goes to the rest of the body. So here's those villi, and each villi is lined with individual simple columnar cells that have microvilli. So <clears throat> simple columnar cells we see throughout the digestive tract once we hit the stomach down to the large intestine, and we have those goblet cells. So mucus production is still important. And we talked about the microvilli being called the brush border because they secrete enzymes as molecules pass by. We have another special structure in the villi, which is part of the immune system, and you're going to have an online test coming up here shortly um, when we get toward the cardiovascular system, talking about the lacteals. And the lacteals help break down and absorb fats. So we don't break down fat until we get to the small intestine, and this little green vessel, part of the lymphatic system, helps break down that fat and, and deliver it and break it eventually down to fatty acids and glycerol. That's the final product of fat breakdown. And the lacteals help with that. So that runs down the middle of each villus along with these blood vessels. So the food comes in contact here. It's absorbed into those cells and then goes in, if it's a fatty molecule, goes into the lacteal and everything else into the blood. And the, the fats that are absorbed into the lacteal, we're going to learn the lymphatic vessels eventually dump into the bloodstream. So they will enter the blood, but just a little bit later after they've been acted on within the lacteal. So we have these special cells um, in the crypts of the epithelium of the intestine that produce juice, intestinal juice, which is an alkaline juice with the help of the pancreas. Um, they have special white blood cells in there that help kill cells that might be infected with bacteria. Lots of different cells line 
the intestines. You don't have to know the details about all of these, the PANF and the intraepithelial lymphocytes, intraendocrine cells. You don't need to go into the details of that, just so you're aware that there's a, a lot of cells lining the small intestine that promote immunity. And then we can replace cells that are damaged over time. There are stem cells that will specialize and become new intestinal cells because we do slough off in our stool uh, dead cells from the digestive tract over time. Remember, deeper in the lining of the small intestine, we have these pyres patches, part of the immune system, clusters of cells that fight infection that may have broken through the, the mucosal layer. And then, like I said, they, uh, the small intestine also secretes an alkaline mucus. And the benefit of the mucus is absorption, transport and absorption of nutrients. So it's good to have the mucus and this intestinal juice that has a high pH. It allows the um, enzymes of the pancreas to act on it and, and do its job. And then we have the accessory organs. So food does not pass through the liver, but Digestion is helped by the liver, and the number one function of the liver is to make bile. Remember that from general A&P. That one, I'm sure that was a test question. So, the liver makes most of the bile, and about 20 to 30 percent of the bile made by the liver is stored in the gallbladder. So it just stores the bile that the liver makes. So the main thing of the liver is to make bile. That's the digestive function of the liver. It has other functions. And the gallbladder just stores. <clears throat> so if you look at how they're related, you can see there's the hepatic ducts that bring bile down to the common bile duct. The cystic duct comes from the gallbladder and that delivers bile. When someone eats a fatty meal, for example, that comes into the common bile duct to the duodenum. When you eat a fatty meal, you also have digestive enzymes that are made by those acenar cells in the pancreas that go through the pancreatic duct to the duodenum. So these are not endocrine functions, right? Endocrine, we have secretions going to the blood. Exocrine cells secrete their stuff to a duct which acts locally. So we're talking about digestive enzymes and bile traveling to the duodenum to act on the food and break it down. Yes? Nowhere because there is no, oh, as far as storage kind of thing? Yeah, the, the, there is no extra bile. The liver makes the bile and because there's nowhere for it to go, it stops making excess bile because otherwise that would damage the pancreas if it overdid it. But what people find then is because they have less readily available bile from the gallbladder, they have a little more trouble after getting the gallbladder removed with digesting fatty things because it's not readily available. It comes strictly from the, from the liver. Yeah. Um, a common cause of getting the uh, gallbladder removed is rapid weight loss throws a lot of fat into the bloodstream when people lose weight really quickly and causes gallstones. And what happens then is cholesterol forms and bile salts form these stones, gallstones, that block this duct. Or it might block the bile duct too. Sometimes it's blocked the duct way down low and the pancreas can't secrete digestive enzymes and the digestive enzymes back up and people develop pancreatitis, which is a very serious condition and they have to get a tube down their throat and into their stomach. We have to suck out their stomach contents. We've got to put them NPO and they are one miserable patient because you know not being able to eat or drink and having stomach pain on top of it is terrible. So I really feel for these patients that have that. The lucky part is we can usually go in and correct that by getting rid of the gallbladder and then they're feeling better. But sometimes we have to wait for the pancreas to calm down a little bit by putting them NPO for a day or two 
before we can go in there and remove the gallbladder. So that's a, a real problem. But um, yeah, so we can get that removed. Another risk factor for getting the gallbladder removed, like we said, um, people that lose weight rapidly. Another one is women right after giving birth or sometimes in their pregnancy. Cholesterol levels kind of get goofy in the pregnancy, in the, during pregnancy right after childbirth, and that can cause the formation of gallstones, and people can have a real issue with that during pregnancy or right after. Uh, the biggest risk factor group are women who have a lifetime of obesity and are over 40 years old. We have found that that's the biggest group of people that go in for gallbladder removal. Yeah, thank you very much. Where's your Scantron? Oh, okay. No, that's fine. Um, so that is the biggest risk factor, is um, kind of just later in life, lifetime obesity and being female. Okay, so we talked about the anatomy of the liver in lab, so I'm not gonna hold you accountable for a lot of that anatomy again. Just know, remember, hepatocytes are liver cells, and they have these lobules, right? So if I do a cross-section of the liver, I see this really uniform patterned appearance. So it enters the liver from the edge of the lobule, works its way to the center, goes to the central vein, and then it continues on from there. So you have this diagram right in your notes. This is from your textbook. So bile is, is secreted and acts upon all this stuff coming in from the edge of the lobule. So this comes from the hepatic portal vein. And then the hepatocytes, which are beige, act on this blood that's coming through the sinusoids, which are these little pathways. And then when it's all done being filtered, it enters into the central vein, which takes it off to the hepatic vein, which leads to the inferior vena cava. So it comes in from the edge and works its way toward the central vein before it leaves the liver and continues on to the rest of the body. So I'm not going to ask you details on anatomy of this diagram because we've done that in lab. So functions, though, again, producing bile. Those hepatocytes, their job is to produce bile and to store fat-soluble vitamins. What are the fat-soluble vitamins? Do you know? Very good, very good. Those are the fat-soluble vitamins. So if a person has liver disease, alcohol, alcoholism, they tend to not eat because they drink all day, and their liver is severely damaged, cirrhosis of the liver. So they come in extremely malnourished. So you'll see if you work in that environment where people come in, like in the ER, or you're dealing with underlying conditions and they are alcoholic, you'll see that uh, nutrition is a big thing. We give them a, a big bag of this yellow IV electrolyte nutrient fluid to kind of get those vitamins back up because the liver can't store those vitamins, so they're very malnourished. So they detoxify, so they you know, clean the blood of like certain chemicals, like we know Tylenol is processed by the liver, ibuprofen is processed by the kidneys, so we have to be careful giving Tylenol to people with liver damage. We have to be careful with ibuprofen in people with kidney damage. Um, also detoxifying the liver. So um, 900 mils of bile per day is how much is produced. Yeah. Is the liver and the kidneys are damaged? Is that your answer? Kidneys are really good at repairing themselves to a certain point. Like if certain, I shouldn't say repairing themselves, um, for taking over for damaged areas. Like we can get down to almost 20% kidney function before we see symptoms. So it's really amazing that if some nephrons are failing, other nephrons can pick up the pace of filtration and absorb, reabsorption. So it just depends, you know, it does progress though, like people with type two, di type 2 or type 1 diabetes, it is uncontrolled, it progresses, and they end up on dialysis if they don't control their blood sugars. Because the glomeruli are tiny, delicate little capillaries, and when they're chronically trying to filter high blood sugars, they eventually break down and are damaged, just like the capillaries in the feet and the capillaries in the retina. We see the same thing, you know, damage to those capillaries. So we see blindness, kidney failure, and skin breakdown in people with uncontrolled diabetes. Yeah. 
Right. That's an immune reaction. Like when the pancreas is damaged in type 1 diabetes, that's an immune issue, autoimmune disease, where people usually have some type of infection they have found before that, like a cold, you know, that just kind of hung on. And then all of a sudden they develop diabetes, type 1 diabetes as a young person. It's more of a young person's disease. And that's where the immune systems destroy those cells and they are gone. Yeah. Oh. Oh my gosh. Yeah, she can't digest anything. She can't get the nutrients out of her food because the digestive enzymes aren't there. There are, yes, yeah. Yeah, those digestive enzymes, you gotta take them all by pill form. Even then, that's a serious, oh my gosh, that sounds terrible. Yeah, I've had patients that have had pancreas, pancreas <laughs> transplants. They were diabetic, they got a pancreas transplant, you know, and now they're not. But. The bad part about that is you know, you're taking transplant, you know, anti-rejection drugs your whole life and you know, is that to the lesser of two evils kind of thing. So, yeah. Okay, so um, what we find in bile salts is bilirubin, which is a formed from the hemoglobin molecule, the breakdown of hemoglobin in our red blood cells, and cholesterol are all part of bile salts. So bilirubin has kind of a yellowish look to it, right? So when a person throws up yellow, you're looking at bile because they're, everything's digested, like when your cat or your dog has that really strong yellow puke on the carpet, right? That's bile. There's nothing in the stomach. That's just a sign of stomach irritation, and there's nothing left to throw up. So, um, what else can we say about this? We're constantly recycling our bile salts. So we're secreting it, using it to break down fat. You don't have that slide? Where in the heck, I gotta update this thing. This is strange. But anyway, the function of bile, let's just write that down. Whatever, you have this slide, right? Yes, okay. The function of bile, let's not miss that is to digest fat. So if you want to keep your gallbladder and take care of it, watch your fat intake. And again, you know, if some of you are parents or future parents, teach your kids now how to make healthy choices. Don't hide the vegetables and trick them into eating healthy foods because they're not going to be able to trick themselves when they're adults, right? They're going to make the choices. So you got to put the foods on the table and, you know, promote healthy choices. And I, I do with my kids. I mean, I have six kids to prove that this does work. I, ha I have some kids that are picky eaters, but they do eat what we serve. Like my daughter yesterday, I was making fish. She's like, I hate fish. I said, well, you're going to have to eat some because that's what we're having for dinner tonight. And I put some breading on the fish. I put some panko breadcrumbs, those real crunchy kind, you know. But I baked it. I didn't fry it. I baked it and put some salt and pepper on it. And she's like, this is really good. Can I have more? Where if I would have said, oh, I'll make you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I, you don't have to have the fish, that's not really helping her learn how to realize that fish can taste good. Maybe you didn't like it plain, you know, with no breading, but a little panko breadcrumb, you'll eat those healthy fats in fish. That's a good thing. And also we've learned that um, the Holman School District, anybody know Holman School District or have kids there? They have this farm to table and they're really big on vegetables and they, they heat them at a really high temperature and when you heat vegetables at like 450 for 15 minutes like broccoli or Brussels sprouts, I mean I hate personally Brussels sprouts, but if you zap them at a really high temperature, the bitter chemicals that make vegetables not taste good break down and become sweet and they have found that they have their elementary kids asking for second helpings of broccoli. You know Holman? Yeah because they like the sweet taste of these vegetables. So we don't just want to push vegetables off the plate. We just got to find other ways to cook them so they're palatable. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's just fantastic. I think Roger King is the guy that is in charge of that. He's, I, 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 knew him through, I know him through 4-H. He does a lot with chickens and pork and yeah. They do really good things. So again, just you know, role modeling those healthy foods because, you know, you want our, our kids to be healthy, and you know, we know our nation is 55% of adults are overweight or, or obese right now, and we've got a next generation of kids coming up. We need to fix that. <clears throat> okay, so again, the gallbladder stores and concentrates the bile. Talked about that already. So now we're going to talk about the pancreas. So the endocrine function, remember, whenever we talk about endocrine, we're talking about secreting things to the blood. So when we look at insulin and glucagon, it's going to the blood. And the exocrine function, we're secreting something to a duct. So it's the pancreatic duct. So what goes in the duct? Digestive enzymes and pancreatic juice. That goes to the duct. That's not heading to the blood, it's going through the duct, it runs right down the middle of the pancreas, dumps into the common bile duct, into the duodenum. Insulin and glucagon go to the blood. The capillaries around the pancreas receive the insulin and glucagon, depending on which one is needed, and takes that. So what does insulin do? Lowers blood sugar. So insulin secretion is highest when? After you eat, yeah, after a meal, after a meal. So when you come in and it's time to check somebody's blood sugar, like those of you that are CNAs, and you see a guy is sitting there and there's half a cookie and a glass of milk next to his tray, is that a good time to check his blood sugar even though he hasn't eaten lunch yet? No, <laughs> because you're gonna give him way too much insulin. That nurse is gonna see that high number and give him way too much insulin that he, then he'll need for his meal. And then he might crash after his meal. So we have to pay attention when we check a blood sugar, ask him, when did you eat last? And if he's got a full mouth or just said five minutes ago, then you'll say, well, we're gonna come back and check in an hour to two hours. Or you're gonna eat and you know that's a problem, right? That you get, that's when you have to tell your patients, we need to check your blood sugar before you eat. So if you're gonna have a snack, you need to let us know so we can get that blood sugar before you have your snack. So we know what you are baseline. But you know, so it's good communication about that. And then glucagon, when is that highest? When would the body be cranking out the glucagon? Yeah, when you haven't eaten for a while. So probably what time of day do you think is highest glucagon secretion? In the morning, yeah, in the morning before you've had breakfast. And some of you might have something called hypoglycemia where you find that if you haven't eaten in a while, you get shaky and sweaty and like, oh my gosh, I forgot to get something to eat. I think we've talked about this last semester, right? And some of you are nodding your heads. Yes, young women, classic problem. I still have it. And I also find if I am on vacation and I eat a donut or something high carb, what do we know about high carb as far as passage through the tract? Yeah, it goes fast through the tract. What do we know about high carbs when it comes to insulin secretion? The more carbs you have, the more insulin you secrete, right? So if I secrete a lot of insulin, and remember this is from the endocrine system, which does it kind of slowly. So I eat my, my donut, my blood sugar is high, donut is absorbed, but I'm still secreting insulin after my donut has passed through my tract. Now what happens, Angie? Sugar crash. Yeah, sugar crash. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, you gotta eat something and I gotta eat something big. And that's what happens to me. I have to eat like a big sub sandwich or something to get my blood sugar to st stabilize. And there has to be protein in there to get it to stay up. But sometimes that's not available. One time I was traveling in the car and I had a blood sugar crash. I was on the interstate and there was nowhere to stop. And I found some dried up Sour Patch Kids in the cup holder that the kids had. <laughs> And I'm like, that's gonna save me right now because I need to get my blood sugar up until I can find a fast food place and find somewhere to eat. And that happened, um, ironically, it was the same thing. I was at the, the, the Hades roller coaster in the Dells and we were in line forever, just standing in line, standing in line. And then all of a sudden I see this young girl come back, come down the steps and she's like really pale and her friend is like, are you okay? And she's like coming down the steps and I'm like, oh, that's not looking good. And then she sits down, like in the you know turnstile area, in that open area, she sits down. 
And I'm like, you, are you okay? And she's like, I don't know. I just feel like I'm going to pass out. And I'm like, well, when did you eat last? And she's like, I don't remember. I'm like, does anybody have any sugar? Does anybody have any sugar? And someone's like, I have some gummy worms. <laughs> I'm like, give them to me. So she ate the gummy worms, sat there for a few minutes, and then she was better. And I think, you know, you should go get something to eat. Because this stuff can creep up on people, and you got to pay attention to that. And if you're not eating well, if you're eating high-carb foods that spike your insulin and pass through your GI tract, you're going to crash. There's a CNA on our floor, too, that was sweating bullets in the nutrition room. And she's like, oh, my gosh, I'm having a blood sugar crash. I'm like, what did you have for breakfast? And she said, I had malt oatmeal. So that's a really high carb breakfast. You probably need protein. Throw an egg in there next time and eat, you know, eat some crackers right now. And she always says, you saved me that day because, you know, blah, blah, blah. And this is just common knowledge stuff. You guys are going to spread the same information. Maybe some of you even know this because you know yourselves, right? I'm just spreading common knowledge. But, or not common knowledge, a little bit of extra knowledge. But, you know, you need to tell your patients that because doesn't that lead to obesity? What if I had donuts every morning for breakfast? I had a sugar crash about 10 o'clock, so then I have more donuts or I eat a big piece of pizza, right? Well, that has a little protein and fat, so that would stabilize my blood sugar. But if I eat a lot of carbs, and don't kids like to eat carbs, right? Cookies, chips, more cookies, juice. They're having sugar crashes and cravings, and then they're just filling it with more sugar. Again, eggs, you know, emptying through the digestive tract very quickly so you're feeling hungry again, but those calories are still there, right? And if they're just sitting watching TV or playing video games, or us binging Netflix or sitting in class, you're going to gain weight, right? So we have to think about our blood sugar and the role of the pancreas and keep our pancreas happy by putting some protein in our meals and healthy fats, and that stabilizes blood sugar. So, Because if I have a crashing patient, the first thing we do is give them uh, orange juice to get their blood sugar up. But then I also give them some peanut butter and crackers or tell them to order some, like a scrambled egg or a hard-boiled egg off the menu to get that protein in there, and that'll keep that blood sugar stable. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you? Good for you. Yeah, that's a high sugar thing. Yeah. If you can get them to eat, if they're awake enough to do that. Yeah. So what that is, is some women throughout their lives, I, I being one of those, um, has low glucagon secretion. Is You don't have good glucagon secretion that you can go, because my husband can go all day and not eat. I'm like, how could you have not eaten? It's 5 o'clock. He's got good glucagon secretion. It's taking care of him, and he's able to function. I can't do that. So if you're that type, you have to know yourself and be prepared, right? <clears throat> okay, so digestive enzymes come from these acenar cells. You guys, do you have a question? What was the experience? Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Small world. You saved her. Yeah. Yeah, that's really bad. And good thing that you stopped because I would personally be afraid to stop if I thought someone was drinking or on drugs and weaving all over the road. I'd be worried that, you know, is it a safe thing to go and help them? So, I mean, yeah, and that's a wonderful thing. And that's a good thing to remember is sometimes it's not alcohol. It could be, right. yeah, low blood sugar. Wow, that's, yeah, crazy. Okay, so. The um, exocrine function goes to the pancreatic duct. That's these cells that secrete the pancreatic juice and 
digestive enzymes. So we need these enzymes to digest our food. And people that have pancreatic cancer, that spreads very quickly to the rest of the body because of the way we know that the digestive tract is served blood-wise, passing through the liver, and the, the lack of function of blood sugar control and secreting digestive enzymes, uh, those cells don't work anymore of the pancreas and they lose weight rapidly and, and pass away. It's a very sad um, cancer that progresses very quickly. So this is just a kind of a look at a view cross-section of the pancreas. Here is the duct. So we have these acenar cells that are contributing to the digestive enzymes and the juice that are going to travel to the duodenum. And because insulin and glucagon are proteins, we see lots of rough ER in the um, pancreas. So their job is they have ribosomes, right, to make the insulin and glucagon. And then the rough ER and the Golgi apparatus help convert that into its final form where it's released. So those are proteins. Rough ER is in charge of protein modification. So this um, pH, high pH, helps to neutralize the chyme. So these uh, enzymes can do their job. Amylase, what does that act on? Starch. We find amylase in the saliva as well. So when you give a baby with no teeth a starchy cracker like a saltine, it just turns into a liquid in their mouth. But if you give them a taco chip, that does not because of those complex cell walls in the corn chip, that, that's not going to break down. Lipases, what does that break down? Yep. And nucleases, <coughs> nucleic acids. We eat, you know, foods that were once living, so they have DNA. And proteases obviously secrete protein, right? So the pancreas is really important for digestive enzymes. Now, this, the, the, again, the simple columnar cells of the small intestine also release digestive enzymes. So the pancreas together with the simple columnar cells of the small intestine are where all those digestive enzymes come from. And then we have bile, again, from the liver to break down those fats. So when we look at what stimulates the release of these enzymes, trypsinogen is activated to trypsin by these brush border enzymes. So some enzymes act as enzymes for other enzymes. <laughs> so you don't have this one? OK. Then I will just cross it off. It's a little more detail than we needed. And that's why I said the only point of this slide is enzymes make act as enzymes for other enzymes. OK, <clears throat> so here just, just showing how we have all these wonderful enzymes coming through the pancreatic duct in their inactive form until they get to the small intestine where they're activated by enzymes of the small intestine. And the whole reasoning behind this is that if the digestive enzymes were released in their active form, they would start to digest the pancreas. So we don't want them to do their job and be activated until they get to the location where they need to do their job. So they're activated in the small intestine by enzymes released from those epithelial cells of the small intestine. Otherwise, we would have no pancreas. And that's why when this bile duct is, is blocked, those enzymes can back up and do damage. So bile secretion. What stimulates it? When we have fatty chyme entering into the small intestine, that's a key stimulus of bile secretion. Do you have this slide? No? Yes? No? Okay. All right. 
Yeah, that one? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to update my PowerPoint. So if it's not in your in your notes, you don't have to know it, okay? So if it's not in the, your packet there, you don't, there's no test questions coming from it. Okay, so again, uh, the gallbladder is stimulated by a hormone from the small intestine called cholecystokinin. And the interesting piece about this is cholecyst refers to the gallbladder. So if a person suffers from, I'm going to write it here because it's easier to type it than to use my horrible mouse, cholecystitis, cystitis means gallbladder inflammation. So if you come into the ER and you've got a lot of right shoulder pain and you say every time you eat something you get sharp pain in the right side of your abdomen going up to your shoulder, they're going to say you probably have an inflamed gallbladder. You have gallstone. So we call, it's called cholecystitis. Then they're going to say we need to remove it because it's really bad. Cholecystectomy means gallbladder removal. So a big fancy word, cholecyst, means gallbladder. And it's funny because when I was first a CNA on cardiopulmonary where I started, I didn't know these terms yet. I wasn't an anatomy teacher yet. And I'd see people with hyponatremia or hypokalemia, and I'm like, what is that? Or cholecystectomy, what is that? And now I'm trying to give you guys a little heads up. So if you see these things, even as a CNA with your patients, you'll have an idea of what's going on. Okay, so um, the vagus nerve, when that's so we're in a when we're in a rest and digest state, that also stimulates the gallbladder, but it's a minor stimulus. It's not a, a big uh, promoter of bile secretion. And causing the hepatopancreatic sphincter to relax means that it's going to allow that to bile to enter into the common bile duct. So this cholecystokinin, again, where does this come from, this CCK? It was on the previous slide. Is this in your notes? Yeah, it's from the small intestinal cells that also promotes pancreatic juice to be secreted by the acenar cells. We also have another hormone from the small intestine called secretin that causes pancreatic juice to be released and also the vagus nerve again. So the vagus nerve, like I said, it can help and promote digestion, but it's not boss of digestion. So these are just, this is just a diagram showing how all those parts work together and the role of cholecystokinin, that hormone of helping gallbladder secrete its contents and helping the pancreas do its job. Talked about a lot of this already. Slow delivery of that chyme, so it has time to be worked on. Segmentation is just a back and forth peristaltic wave that we see in the small intestine. So it's kind of like how a, an earthworm moves, right? Kind of like back and forth, but forward. So it's like back and forth contraction, but it's a net forward movement. That's how things move through the small intestine. And then it hits the last part of the intestinal tract, which is the large intestine and the anal canal. So I'm trying to look for the large. Oh. Okay, when we look in at the large intestine before it reaches the rectum and the anus, the job of the large intestine, I sh there's a missing slide here, so I'm just going to add it here. The large intestine's job. is to secrete mucus, just like everywhere else in the digestive tract. That's the number one job, is to secrete mucus, to keep 
stool soft and moving through the digestive tract. It's also its job is to absorb bicarbonate ion, because bicarbonate ion is part of that intestinal juice, keeping the pH up. Well, we don't want to lose that because bicarbonate ion plays a big role in controlling our blood pH. So it absorbs that back to the blood. Bless you. So it absorbs bicarbonate ion. So if a person has diarrhea, what are they at risk for? What, what's their pH going to do if they have diarrhea? They're losing this basic bicarbonate ion. They're losing. Base has a high pH, right? If I lose high pH during diarrhea, what happens to blood pH? It goes low. Yeah, we can end up with a metabolic acidosis if you have diarrhea. We're going to talk about that at the end of the semester. But diarrhea, we lose base. Okay, so that's good, bad, very bad. That's how you get electrolyte imbalances. So that's why we drink Gatorade and we replace fluids in people that have had a lot of diarrhea. And if you vomit, what's in the stomach? What what is the major? What's the major chemical in the stomach? Did we say that the parietal cells make? hydrochloric acid. So if I, if I lose low pH from vomiting, what's going to happen to my blood? My blood pH is going to go up because I don't have enough hydrogen ion to bring it down. Yeah, so if you have vomiting, you end up with metabolic alkalosis because you're losing hydrogen ion. Diarrhea, the opposite. You're losing bicarbonate ion, you end up with metabolic acidosis. We'll talk more about that, but just so you have a little bit of background on that. Both. <laughs> Depends which is worse, which has more volume. Usually there's more volume of diarrhea than there is vomit because people stop eating. Yeah, and double bucket flus, we've all unfortunately probably had those, right? That's the worst. That's the worst. <laughs> yeah, so that's where electrolyte imbalances are really, yeah, bad shape. <clears throat> okay, so secreting mucus. Absorbing vitamin, or I'm um, sorry, absorbing bicarbonate ion, and then there's some um, vitamin secretion. In the large intestine. Oops. So the bacteria in ferment the chyme and release the B vitamins, K vitamins, and biotin. So important functions of the large intestine. It's not just to hold stool, right? It's to reabsorb bicarbonate. And a big one related to diarrhea is reabsorbing water. Because if we empty our bowels before it's natural and before it's time when you have abnormal bowel function with diarrhea, um, big water losses, very quick, fast water loss with diarrhea. Because that's a huge amount of water that was meant for our blood. It's meant for our plasma, where the large intestine is supposed to reabsorb that water and put it back in the plasma. And if it doesn't, we're going to be dehydrated very quickly. And the elderly and very young children their kidneys aren't very good anymore, and their hypothalamus is not very good at conserving water and knowing when the body is low on water. So therefore, the elderly don't feel thirsty when they're dehydrated. And they don't like to get up to pee in the middle of the night, so you'll have a water cup for them after dinner, and they're like, oh, no, I don't want any of that. I don't want to pee. Well, that's very bad for kidney function and for electrolyte balance, because we need water as a solute for all of our chemical reactions. <clears throat> so we need to encourage water. But the other side is also true. The longer stool sits in there, so if you work in a nursing home and you have a bowel record, you really need to pay attention to that. Or even if you don't work in a nursing home and you work in a hospital and no one's tracking the bowels or paying attention, then, hey, this guy hasn't pooped in a week. We should be concerned about that because the longer stool sits in the bowel, water is being absorbed, 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 absorbed. So it sits at the end of the large intestine and gets drier and harder and stickier 
And then if you keep eating and adding on top of it, people can get up what's called a megacolon, where their colon is, the, the last part of the large intestine is so stretched out that sticky bowel mass can't even make it through the rectum and the anal canal. There's no way it's going to pass through. Or it passes through and it's stuck in the anal and rectal canal and now you have what's called impaction and that's a big problem among the elderly because they just, they, what are the foods we're feeding in the nursing home? Are they high fiber, crunchy salads and apples? No, it's mushy, warm, high salted, well not always salted, but tasty foods sometimes, you know, like downstairs, you know, in the cafeteria, what are some of the foods that students are eating on a regular basis when I'm standing in line? Burgers and fries and pizza and pasta, those are all constipating foods. And if you have a person laying in bed taking pain meds, which slows the bowel, they're a recipe for constipation. And that can be very serious. There have been people that have been backed up so much that they're actually spitting stool, that their entire tract is backed up. And that happens with tumors too. People have a tumor blocking their large intestine and no stool can get past that tumor. Everything backs up. So if we keep feeding people, but it's not coming out the other end, we have to get concerned. And then there's certain things we can give people. Things like Miralax, which is called uh, polyethylene glycol powder. That creates a hypertonic solution in the gut and it pulls water into the stool. So that makes it liquidy. But again, if you're too late in the game and you have a hard, almost solid mass, and another thing that happens is, is it becomes like rabbit turds, right? It rolls around at the end of the large intestine and you have these hard balls of stool that are, again, they're stuck in there. And they, you know, the, a lot of you are going into nursing, right? Because you're imagining hanging IV fluids and having these great conversations and doing these high level nursing interventions. The worst of nursing is when you have to digitally go in and deal with an impaction. So you have to go in with your fingers in the rectal, in the anal opening rectal canal and scoop out these hard balls of stool that form when a patient has been not going for a really long time. So we try not to let our patients get to that point, right? So we have to respect the job of the large intestine and know what it's doing and pay attention. Make sure our patients are getting water. Make sure they're taking the Miralax. If it's a as-needed medicine and they haven't pooped in three days, give it to them twice a day. We just need to, to help our patients along. And sometimes they don't want to talk about it. We want to talk about our bowels, right? It's embarrassing, but it really relates to health, so we have to talk about it. So think about that role of reabsorbing water. And think about yourself. I'll guarantee you, I'm not going to take a poll, but I guarantee you over half the class probably has constipation issues, but they don't want to talk about it because no one wants to. Drink water. And I see a lot of water bottles, which is great, but we need to increase our water intake. If your bowels are not cooperating with you and how you eat, up your water content. A lot of us are under hydrated. We drink a lot of coffee, which stimulates the bowel, but it doesn't help hydrate us. All right, so now we get to the end of the digestive tract. So we have these valves that open and close and slowly let stool come through. So it's like three doorways. Because you don't want to open up one door and poof, out it goes, right? We need control over our bowels, right? So we have these wonderful valves to slowly let things through, like quick open up a door and shut it again kind of things. So we don't want to open up the floodgates before it's time. So that allows gas to pass through without stool. Those, those rectal valves. And then the anal canal is at the end of the rectum, is a short anal canal. There's smooth muscle that we can't control, so that's involuntary. And then there's the external anal sphincter that we can control. And that's when kids say, oh, I gotta go poop, because they can feel it. They have control over that skeletal muscle. Babies that don't have control, they just go, right? And, Nobody knows, or well, you know, but um, you can't prepare for it. So this is voluntary, under control. This is involuntary. And we feel the urge to have a bowel movement when stool passes through this region and hits this sphincter, and that's where we can contract that and say it's not the right time. And it's a reflex. The control of this movement is a reflex. So here's the skeletal muscle. 
This is the smooth muscle, so we can control this opening, and it's a reflex. And what causes it is distension of the rectal walls stimulates that movement. And there's another one. Um, yeah, that's not shown on here. Another um, reflex for this is also from the stomach. When the stomach stretches, it stimulates the bowels to, to, to move stool into the rectum. Also, fatty chyme stimulates um, stool, mass movements in the large intestine to enter into the rectum. So people find when they're really constipated or, you know, or they haven't gone in a while, they'll go to McDonald's and have, and some runners will talk about this too. Okay, I got a big run in the morning, I need to make sure my bowels are empty, so we're gonna do the, a student of mine was a big runner, he even had a name for it, I forgot what it was called. But you go to McDonald's and have a big supersized fatty meal for lunch the day before the run and you're guaranteed a good bowel movement after that because of the fatty chyme stimulates the large intestine to move into the rectum. Um, Taco John's. <laughs> Spicy foods can be irritating as well, yes. Um, also, the stretch of the stomach is really active in young people where you're eating a large meal at a restaurant and you feel the urge to move your bowels within an hour of eating a large meal. That's an active thing in young people. As people age, that doesn't happen. So that's why the kids, when you take them out to a restaurant and you're not even quarter way through your steak and they're all done with their burger, they're like, I have to go to the bathroom. And now you're sitting in the bathroom while they have a bowel movement while your steak is eating cold. And that's the last place you want to be, right? <laughs> but that's the joy of parenting you can look forward to. That's the gastrocolic reflex. Colic refers to colon, gastro stomach. So stomach, colon, have a nerve connection. Stomach gets stretched, colon wants to, to empty. And that's a good thing. But again, it's active in, in younger people. So some of you in your 20s, you may, still may have this. But as you get older, you can sit and enjoy your coffee, and you can sit there at the table, and you don't have to go for hours until um, the, the bowels are stimulated to move. But again, when the, when the rectum is stretched, that's classic stimulation. So when kids are constipated, some, or um, elderly adults, it sits in that sigmoid colon, and it becomes a hardened mass. And what can happen, though, is the bowels are trying to contract and move it through. So what happens is liquid stool will slip past this solid mass and then come out the rectum. And people think, oh, you know, you're not constipated. Look at you have a little bit of diarrhea in your pants. And this is what happens with kids and the elderly. So you wouldn't say this to an elderly person, obviously, but with a kid, a parent could be frustrated and say, what do you mean you're constipated? Look at you're, you're going in your pants. Just go sit on the toilet. Well, sitting on the toilet for six hours is not gonna necessarily move that mass that's in the sigmoid colon into the rectum. We have to deal with the mass before we can get kids to go. So sometimes kids need, again, like Miralax powder to, to, to soften the mass so it can move. Sometimes they need, um, you know, something a little more harsh, like a laxative to get things going. My son was going into the military and he's like, I gotta make sure I'm empty because I'm gonna be sitting on a plane and I'm gonna be just sitting in this, just receiving unit for a long time. And I'm like, okay. So we hit him hard with a bunch of laxatives and that's okay, you know, for a short period of time, just empty out. And people do that that are marathon runners. They empty out before their marathon because the last thing you need for 26.2 miles is a bowel full of stool, right? So they empty out with some of these harsher things so they can proceed. And it's, so laxatives are okay once in a great while, but people that abuse laxatives, right? People that give themselves diarrhea to lose weight, that's a, a huge issue and that's a sign of anorexia or bulimia, you know, eating disorder. So that's not something that we want to um, definitely promote. But laxatives serve a purpose for those patients that need it. <clears throat> Questions on the large intestine? All right, I want to show you a video that summarizes the activity of the s digestive system and it's real cameras showing you the different parts. So it looks a little gross because the digestive tract on the inside is a little gross to look at. So um, be prepared for that. 